Revolution of the Daleks is a good piece of entertainment, albeit one that is somewhat oddly paced, and it helps if you can switch your brain off because there are plenty of holes to poke in this episode if you think too hard about it. But provided you can do that, it's alright. The episode begins with the Doctor still in prison following on from the Timeless Children, and this is the part where the pacing issues are most prominent, because nothing is happening. It's just the Doctor going about her daily routine in prison and reciting Harry Potter. Hey BBC, you could have edited that reference out, you know. There was time. Mind you, they're still nominating JK Rowling for awards in spite of the harm she's done to the trans community, so I shouldn't really be surprised. I feel like these scenes were kind of necessary to give a sense of how long the Doctor has been imprisoned for, but the trouble is, not much is happening in the Earth scenes either to just oppose that slowness with. The fam are investigating Jack Robertson and his security drones that are actually Dalek casings, but without the Doctor they are unable to do very much and consequently the episode just feels like it's spinning its wheels for the first 20 minutes of the runtime. Then when Captain Jack rescues the Doctor and brings her back to Earth, my initial thought was, well what was the point of her being in prison then? But it's when Yaz emotionally delivers the line, we were worried about you, that it started to click. The Doctor disappears for 10 months, and her friends had no idea whether or not she'd ever return or if she was even still alive, and exploring the ramifications of that is what this is all about. The beauty of this is how it justifies Captain Jack's inclusion, because he is a reminder that the Doctor has a history when it comes to doing this. They did the exact same thing with Jack, and they did it with Amy too. Honestly, whenever Captain Jack is on screen, I'm somewhat conflicted, because as nice as it is to see him again, he doesn't belong in this era, and the show really needs to be forging its own identity, not rather riding on RTD or nostalgia, which the BBC have been doing a bit too much of lately. However, when he's comforting Yaz and assuring her the joy of travelling with the Doctor is worth the pain, it feels like there's a thematic reason for Jack to be there other than pure nostalgia, and that's good. Yaz is clearly the most beaten up of the three, and it's obvious even if I hadn't already known beforehand that she was going to be staying on. There's some brutal subtext in the moment when the Doctor says, when have I ever let you down before, and Yaz just stares back at her over the con. Graham and Ryan, on the other hand, have simply moved on with their lives, and that's evident in their behaviour throughout the episode. It's a wonderfully tragic ending that the Doctor arrived ten months too late and essentially missed her time with them. Far more poignant than killing one of them off for cheap shock value, which some people like Ace Creeper wanted for some reason. Unfortunately, as Stu Bagfell pointed out, Show Don't Tell continues to be Chris Chibnall's biggest downfall, as Ryan spends the whole episode talking about how he's had time to reconnect with his mates and his dad off screen screen, which is all very well, but we really needed to see that in order for this payoff to be truly effective, and that would have made for a much better use of the runtime while the Doctor is stuck in space prison. Anyway, with the Doctor now back on Earth, the main plot can actually get going. So the gang confront Jack Robertson a second time, who then shows them his production line of Dalek casings, and this is the point where it becomes necessary to suspend your disbelief quite a lot, because the episode expects you to believe that this guy working for Jack Robertson has somehow managed to clone a new Dalek creature, which from within its tank has been able to basically hack into Jack Robertson's computer system and use his resources to build a Dalek growing facility in Japan, and also modify the casings to allow the creatures to teleport inside. Personally, I was able to just go along with this in the moment, but your mileage may vary depending on whether or not all of this is a stretch too far for you. It seemed like there was going to be a vague attempt at some social commentary here, what with the government introducing these literal hate machines to the streets everywhere for the purpose of security and protecting our borders, but sadly these themes remain surface level only and are never actually explored in any depth, which is a shame. We then get another switch your brain off moment as the Doctor decides the best solution for defeating the Daleks is to call more Daleks. Yeah, there's no logic to this and the episode even flat out admits it's a totally bonkers plan, but the Doctor just does it anyway. Don't get me wrong, it was great to see the bronze Daleks again and I was looking forward to a good old Dalek civil war, because while Stu Bagfall may argue it's been done to death and that may be true in the classic series and the audio dramas, we haven't actually had one yet on screen in the modern era. The trouble is, we still didn't get a Dalek civil war. What we got was two factions of Daleks shooting at each other on a bridge. If there was a civil war happening, it was off screen. Like, I get filming on location is expensive, but could you not have at least done some more CGI shots of them fighting in the skies or something? Like, aren't the new Daleks supposed to be all over the country? Anyway, with the new Daleks all wiped out, the Doctor then defeats the Bronze Daleks 
Daleks by getting them all to fly into the second TARDIS, which then sends itself into the void or something. It's neat that Chibnall made use of there being a second TARDIS left on Earth after the events of the Timeless Children, but it's yet another stretch of logic that every single Dalek feels the need to fly into this TARDIS. Wouldn't it make more sense for some of them to wait outside just in case it is a trap? I know they all hate the Doctor very much and would love to be the one to exterminate her personally, but still. The companion goodbye scenes are quite well done, and having Ryan and Graham on top of the hill with Ryan still not quite able to ride the bike is really the perfect and most fitting ending for these characters. Again though, their whole arc would have been much more powerful if we'd actually got to see them living their lives without the Doctor and moving on. That's really the theme with Revolution of the Daleks, the old Chibnall trademark of a bunch of good story ideas but all underdeveloped or lacking in one way or another, be it the companion departures, the social commentary, the civil war, the leaps in logic with the Daleks' plan. It's not as bad as some of Chibnall's previous attempts, but it's frustrating, because this honestly feels like the second or maybe third draft of a brilliant story. I mean, it's good, but it's not great, and with some workshopping and kicking around, it just might have been. I'm Midnight, and I travel in time and space. And trains.